Thanks, John, for that introduction. Uh, just for the record, I only have one master's degree, not, not multiple. I just wanted to say that straight before we get started. Look, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak this morning. It's actually a bit of a surprise because my name hasn't been associated with Mahara for many years, but actually that's no big deal. I'm only one of Mahara's parents, and Mahara achieved its independence at quite an early age. I guess I'm speaking about Mahara as if it were a person and myself as if I'm paternally related to it. Uh, actually, it's a promising metaphor for exploring Mahara's history and also speculating about its future. What I want to talk about with you today is Mahara's journey from being a, a glint in my eye across its career to date, right through to its looming midlife crisis. You see, right now, Mahara is close to 33 years of age in human terms. Its development began in mid-2006, um, a little over seven years ago. So if you're aging at the rate of around 4.7 human years per actual year, you're on the verge of middle adulthood. And with middle adulthood comes a host of new challenges. So I'd like to explore Mahara's life story with you this morning, relating Mahara to Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. In other words, we'll explore Mahara's history and potential future using a framework of human development. I'll start out by relating internet years to the theory of psychosocial development. From there, we'll consider Mahara's story as it's grown from conception to infancy, then to childhood, preschool and school years, adolescence, and on to young adulthood, where at the age of 33, it now finds itself. From there, I'll talk about its looming midlife crisis, and also explore a way in which it might actually become forever young. To be able to do this, though, we'll need to start with a few assumptions. So, let's begin with the biggest assumption. How old is Fido? How many dog years to a human year? Seven. Okay, right. So you can all relate to that. So according to popular belief, a dog year is around seven human years. It's not actually conclusive that one human year is seven dog years because dogs get to 18 to 25 in about two years of, uh, of dog time. So I freely accept that the comparison isn't truly scientific. So if dogs develop and decline at the rate of seven years per human year, how about web apps? Well, according to the Fat Ducks blog, an internet year is around about 4.7 human years. So, the, sorry, a, a human year. The other way around, my, my apologies. An internet year is around 4.7 human years. So the author of the blog post is Eric Race, and, and you may have, may have heard of him. Um, he looked for an industry that went through stages similar to that of the internet. So Eric Race is a prominent author on the subject of information architecture. Anyway, Race was looking for an industry that went through an initial period of, in, of, of invention, followed by a very broad adoption with a clear end to its pioneering stage. The industry also had to have a long period of incremental innovation, followed by a long-term global presence. So apparently, the rollout of the internet has broadly uh, followed the dynamics of the auto industry. So significantly, the 1929 stock market crash marks the end of pioneering for the auto industry in ways similar to the uh, high-tech dot-com bubble of 2001. So both were landmarks in terms of how the industry progressed to the next stage. So based on Eric Race's calculations, we can suggest that the age of various things associated with the web is around about 4.7 years. So TCP IP, the Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol, uh, was standardized in 1982. It makes it a classic 150 years of age. The Internet itself was commercialized in 1995, making the Internet as we know it a grandfatherly 89 years of age. Now, this isn't to suggest that the Internet's about to die of old age, okay? Any more than we're about to stop buying cars. Uh, internet years are a way of exploring industry dynamics in business cycles, not necessarily uh, signaling pending death. Sometimes, though, the Internet age of something does tell a very intriguing story. So take Yahoo, for example, founded in 1994. It's 94 in human years, so it didn't age as gracefully as it might have. Google is now a respectable 75 years old, although it seems much younger for reasons that I'll explain later. Facebook recently celebrated 47 years in human terms, and I'm fairly sure Facebook seems about that age in terms of its relevance to current youth. So for the purposes of this presentation, let's start with the assumption that the metabolism of internet life is roughly 4.7 years per human year. 
So let's take Internet Years as a rough and ready guide of how Internet services and products reach maturity and as signals as how they need to respond in order to keep themselves current. You see, unless they reinvent themselves or work tremendously hard to keep themselves young, Internet services will eventually show signs of midlife, senior maturity, and retirement. So on this basis, Mahara is roughly 33. So let's explore what it means in terms of its historical development and also its current challenges. There won't be a test on this slide later. I want to make use of Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. Now, Eric Erickson was a German-born American psychologist. He died in 1994 at the grand old age of 92. So he was roughly 432 internet years old. Erickson was the psychologist responsible for the term identity crisis, which stems from his work on personality. So essentially, Erickson suggested eight stages of life, each of which is a significant period of human development. So these are the stages here on the slide. At each stage, life circumstances will shape you toward one or other of the basic conflict characteristics. For example, at the ages of zero to two, you experienced infancy. During these years, you will have learned either basic trust of other people or basic mistrust of other people, largely depending on the relationship you had with your mother. And I won't be counseling anyone after the session, so please just <laughs> not go there at all. So during this stage, you will have learned the extent to which you can actually trust the world based on such things as whether you experienced feeding or abandonment. Now, Erickson's theory is a fantastically interesting one. He theorizes that if you did not overcome the crisis at each stage of life, you end up having to revisit the crisis at later stages. Otherwise, you find it difficult to develop further. So, for example, if you are not able to develop a sense of competence during your school age years, you're likely to have a sense of personal inferiority until you are able to develop a sense of industry. So if you don't overcome the psychosocial crisis at each age step, you are destined to revisit it until you actually do. So in Erickson's theory, we can see why some people don't act their age. They may well be stuck at some past stage of psychosocial development, not yet successfully resolved in their past. Okay, I'll revisit the slide from time to time as we explore the experiences of Mahara as it progressed through them. So Mahara is about 33 in internet years, so it's halfway through middle adulthood. What I want to do is tell Mahara's story at each stage of development it has experienced to give you a sense of who Mahara is and also what it will soon face. Let me tell you right from the start, though, that Mahara has led a very, very charmed life so far. I need to start at the age of conception, and it's here where I probably need to remove myself from the metaphor. You see, I'm probably Mahara's mother. <laughs> and, uh, Dr. Bill Anderson, uh, who was a colleague at Massey University and later my primary PhD supervisor, could be considered Mahara's father. Now, this has some very icky associations with it that I'd rather just avoid because Bill and I are actually just good friends. <laughs> anyway, Mahara was conceived on the ground floor of the Massey University Hokkafudu campus tower block, which you can see in the background of the photo, shortly after 10.30 a.m. on a weekday in mid-2005. Bill and I were talking after morning tea, and I mentioned that some funding was being made available for the last round of the ECDF, the E-Learning Collaborative Development Fund. Bill mentioned that e-portfolios were likely to be an area of interest. So from that conversation, I prepared a proposal for the ECDF fund, suggesting the development of an e-portfolio application for the New Zealand tertiary sector. At the time, e-portfolios were in their very early days, and there, was, uh, there were a few platforms available, but none of them were actually of much use. At the time, I was with the Massey University College of Education. We'd just begun a trial with the iWebfolio ePortfolio platform after considering ePortaro and the only other two open source applications at the time, Theospi and ELG. So our experience in trialing and evaluating these platforms indicated that there were some significant gaps that none of them really addressed. You see, none of them were really truly user-centered and that they didn't provide the user with sufficient control over what they actually presented in their ePortfolios. None of them had adequate group functionality either. So the, the portfolios that people were able to present were largely just one-off static presentations of artifacts. And you can see PowerPoint and also web pages 
as a viable alternative back in those days. So it was quite clear that none of these applications were really developed with the flexibility a user or educator might want. We wanted to develop something that would empower the user to develop and maintain their own web presence in ways suitable for formal education, informal learning, and also for lifelong learning. In other words, it had to work for teachers, students, and professionals in the workplace. So this project summary describes what we aimed to achieve. And you can see from the, the main emphases in bold there what we were trying to achieve through the proposal. We were going to develop an application and develop guidelines for its use. So right from the start, we intentionally linked the application with its use. This became a real strength for Mahara because unlike the various alternatives which began with a technological solution, we wanted to link the development with exploration of the actual pedagogical problem. Flexibility, you'll see, was also a foundational and an objective from the very beginning. We didn't want to lock users into a particular template, which is something Theospi did, and we also wanted to give them control over what they shared and to whom. So this is what the objective to uh, generate multiple presentations by students for various publics part meant. It's actually this feature, which we originally called Views, but is now called Pages, that set Mahara apart in its early life. Finally, we wanted this to take on a life of its own, because critical to the long-term success of the project would be its adoption by the open source community. And I'm happy to say that we did achieve that. The very fact we're all here today is proof of that. So we were very fortunate on a number of counts. Firstly, the previous rounds of the ECDF had already invested heavily in open source development. It's largely from the uh, early ECDF projects that most of us will have adopted Moodle as a learning management system. Second, there was a lot of interest in ePortfolios at the time, and we were able to connect with contacts in AUT, the University of Victoria Wellington, and also Open Polytechnic to take our bid forward. So the project was successfully funded. We had uh, $568,000 allocated to us, with the project formally starting in July 2006. We made two incredibly wise decisions to begin with. Uh, we employed Meredith Henson as our project manager, and we opted to work with Catalyst. So we brought together our steering group, and we got to work. Now, over half of the amount allocated here went directly into actual development and coding. The rest sponsored a series of case studies, uh, best practice literature review, which is still a, a landmark in the literature for ePortfolios, uh, project management, and also the inevitable institutional overhead. So if Bill and I were the parents, there were many midwives Actually, I'm probably struggling here with the metaphor because in many ways, all of those names listed here could be considered Mahara's parents, and that parallel goes to places where I'm sure none of us would be very comfortable with. I'm proud to say, though, that I did chair the group, and I'm still prouder to say that many of the parental team have publicly stated that Mahara wouldn't be the success it was without their input. In each case, they're absolutely correct. Uh, the steering group of Mahara achieved a remarkable synergy with each contributing a perspective that benefited the overall outcome. I'm also proud to say that we met all of our objectives within budget and within time frame. Now, there were some tense moments to be sure, but we got there. It was also during this period that I edited the definition of what an e-portfolio is in Wikipedia. And the definition remains largely intact to this day. Although one of you is probably going to go home and change it now. Just to <laughs> So this slide describes Mahara's gestation. Let's now follow its development from birth, picking up on Ericsson's stages. Now it's clear from what I've mentioned thus far that Mahara was begun with high hopes. Its years of infancy as it learned to walk and talk during the case study phases of the ECDF project, it was adequately fed and nurtured by its parental group. Actually, Mahara had to grow up rather quickly its first internet years were pretty much assisted by steroids, something I don't uh, recommend for every infant. We worked on a very, very tight time frame to develop a version of Mahara that we could take to case study. We began the project in mid-2006, and we had to have a workable prototype in that place in time for case studies, which would begin in January 2007. So we didn't have a lot of time to come up with our first functional release. So we selected Catalyst as a developer, but it didn't take us long to run into problems. And I, I hasten to add that these weren't the result of Catalyst, uh, neither were the result of Meredith's involvement. 
Rather, the solutions to the problems demonstrated uh, just really reflect how good our choice of developer and project manager were. The main problem was we selected ELG as the open source application that we would build our new features on. You see, we never intended to build a new ePortfolio system from scratch. As with previous ECDF projects aligned with Moodle, we figured that our best return on the funds would be to take an existing open source platform and actually add some new features to it. Soon after examining the code, though, we found that ELG was not as good as we hoped for under the bonnet. Uh, the code was described as, I think, ugly was the term used, although there may well have been uh, further expletives used within the Catalyst team, uh, to the extent that too much time would be required to unravel it uh, before adding our new features to it. We responded fairly quickly as a team, and uh, we instructed Catalyst to begin afresh. And it's here that I should really make mention of Penny Leach as one of Mahara's parents, uh, at least as a godparent. Penny was a very outspoken original developer of Mahara at Catalyst, and from memory, I think it was Penny who suggested the name Mahara for our fledgling application. Anyway, we found early on that we had to build again from scratch, but still have something ready for the 2007 case studies. So Mahara had to learn to walk and talk rather quickly. At the time we learned we had to begin again, it would have been easy to just abandon the project as simply being too hard. It was going to be a real challenge to have a viable new ePortfolio application ready for live use at AUT, Massey University, and also Victoria University. Instead, we focused on feeding our development funds to begin again, to the extent that we offered a bare-bones ePortfolio that was still effectively being built while the case study users were using it, uh, similar to the EDS ad, you know, the passenger jets being built as the passengers were there. And, yeah, it's uh, quite a good metaphor for Mahara's development. So if the positive outcome of the infancy years is the development of hope in life, I'm satisfied that Mahara learned to trust the world during this stage. It was fed, not abandoned, and so it learned to trust its users and the development community. So as an early child, Mahara had fresh code, proud parents, and some success as a platform. The case studies went actually really well. User problems were the main source of feedback, which isn't really surprising when you entrust a lot of tertiary education to a two-year-old. During this stage, Mahara was very fortunate to reach an international audience. So the International Eiffel Conference held one of its portfolio trilogy events in Wellington, in fact, here at Te Papa, and we had the opportunity to draw more attention to Mahara in 2007. I was able to provide a plenary session emphasizing e-portfolios as being able to provide a user-centered web presence which is something I'll come back to later. As the ECDF project closed, Gordon Sutterby and Richard Wiles were instrumental in securing Ministry of Education funding for a hosted instance of Mahara. The My Portfolio AC.NZ service is a direct result of this funding. And of course, Richard continues his involvement with Mahara to this day through Kineo Pacific. During this stage of Mahara's psychosocial development, it's easy to see that it had developed the virtue of will again assisted by its parents. So Mahara here began a transition from a publicly funded project to a commercial application with increasing independence. So the ECDF project was successfully concluded and Mahara began its preschool years. At this time though, it was still only small scale and largely New Zealand centered. So at the end of the ECDF project, we had a stable release, Mahara 0.7.3, a full suite of user guides for both students and staff, a research-based guide for implementation, documented case studies, a clean code base, an agreed roadmap, a set of policy guidelines, and also footholds into major New Zealand tertiary institutions. So Ericsson's exist existential question here is, is it okay to be me? Was it okay to be Mahara at the stage? Well, yeah, I think it was. Mahara had achieved autonomy as an application rather than suffering the shame and doubt of being a closed project which would then be shelved. Mahara had reached a stable level of development and was more than just a, a set of code. It actually had a whole lot of user guides, etc. with it. So if you were able to make use of Mahara in these early days, you'd have access to the application, user guides, and also an emerging community of practice. According to Ericsson, the preschool years are a small yet significant stage of our lives, and for Mahara, it was no different. 
For this stage, imagine the significant relationship of family to equate to adoption by the open source community. As a free application with no direct revenue streams from sales, it was vital that Mahara be accepted by the open source development community. We'd successfully exhausted the ECDF funding, so Mahara had to learn to depend on more than just its parents. So Mahara essentially left home at the age of four. Again, Richard Wiles and Catalyst were key here. It was vital that Mahara get a further injection of development, otherwise it wouldn't really be suitable as an independent e-portfolio application with a future. So at the end of the ECDF project, Mahara was fuller of potential than it was really of features. Uh, the 0.7.3 release worked, but it was still fairly clunky. My final report to the Tertiary Education Commission, prepared with Meredith, documents that we finished the formal project with a stable release, but that further funding uh, needed to be secured for the project to continue. And it's here that the Ministry of Education uh, gave us the breakthrough. Ironically, the funding came from the schooling sector. So Mahara was developed as a result of a Tertiary Education Commission, or TEC, fund. In its preschool years, though, the Ministry of Education stepped in and saw fit to invest in it because of its potential for the entire education sector. Let me just run a quick poll here. How many of you are here from the primary sector? Okay, a small handful. How about the secondary sector? Right, wow, okay, a lot of you. Tertiary sector? Okay, how about from the commercial sector? A few of you, okay. So it's easy to see how Mohara went originally from a tertiary funded project to something right through uh, across the, uh, the different sectors represented here, which is great. So by the end of its first human year, Mahara had a clear endorsement from the Ministry of Education. Uh, it had commercial interests deeply aligned with the open source community. It was set to go. It was this that saw Mahara come to its 1.0 release and also successfully transition through its school age years and gain its international exposure. So Mahara had gone beyond what we had originally developed it for, the tertiary setting, which was a real breakthrough. With the Ministry of Education funding provided, Catalyst invested a considerable amount of time into making Mahara ready for wider release. And in April of 2008, Mahara 1.0 was launched. So in terms of Ericsson's psychosocial development at this stage, Mahara needed to finish with a sense of purpose. By the time Mahara 1.0 was released, it had a clear place as a leading e-portfolio application. Rather than having a sense of guilt at remaining at a stable yet largely immature 0.73 release, Mahara now had the features available to enable it to do, move, and act. So all of this in a little over one human year. And it was about at this stage that my own involvement with Mahara faded. That first year was an incredibly intense time, but we did it. Mahara left home, if you like, at the age of five. But it was well ready for it. Who here remembers the first day their five-year-old went to school? Okay, who was the most upset about it? Yeah, okay. So Mahara 1.0 was launched in April 2008, which marks the beginning of its school years. I think why parents become so emotional at their child's first day of school is that we are all well aware of the stakes involved uh, associated with the school years, because it's at this stage of life that we develop a sense of competence facing squarely the psychosocial crisis of industry versus inferiority. It's in our school years that we confront the question of whether we have what it takes to make it in the world of people and things. I think this slide really says it all. I think Mahara had what it took. The release of version 1.2 was actually at its peak in terms of downloads, uh, with more recent download figures per year in the realm of 10,000 or so. Release candidates since 2011 have averaged around 400, so there are literally hundreds of people around the world directly interested in Mahara's ongoing development. In 2009, the first annual Mahara UK event was held, and Mahara is also typically a stream in Moodle Moot events, so it's had a really good exposure in the international sphere. I understand that 2014 is also a significant year. Uh, we've got New Zealand's inaugural Mahara Hui, and as Don mentioned earlier, on the 3rd of March of this year, we had the first Makara conference held in Scotland. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Back to the school years. Suffice to say that these are critical years, where Mahara might easily have become overshadowed by the ever-developing ELG, which is still around today, and also new applications such as PeoplePad, 
and also those uh, silly little integrated ePortfolio platforms you find in learning management systems such as, um, well I'll say Blackboard, my apologies, you said that. <laughs> Mahara showed though that it is in no way inferior. So on the contrary, we now have considerable industry backing. Everyone's getting behind the application and its ongoing development. So Mahara had proven its competence and also its popularity. Let's now advance to the adolescent years. So um, during this stage, Mahara was a teenager. Although teenage years seem to go in one of two directions. I mean, thinking back on your own teenage years, for some of you, it was probably a stage it was a real mess. For others of you, though, it was probably relatively stable. Perhaps given its successful school years, Mahara was ready for a stable and, well, effective adolescent stage. There's one thing, though, that I think Mahara got particularly right. And it was its strong connection with Moodle, thanks primarily to the Mahoodle integration. Uh, any of you using Mahoodle here, integrating the two together? Okay, so some of you are using both systems. Great. It was because of Mahoodle that we made use of Mahara at Laidlaw College in 2009. So Mahoodle made for a single sign-on and a smooth integration across um, Moodle and also Mahara. But there is also a danger here. You see, there's a danger that Mahara might be perceived as nothing more than just an extension of Moodle. So Mahara is often uh, in Moodle moots, as I mentioned earlier. It's great on, one on the one hand, open source applications that naturally fit together should support each other. But there's also a danger in that Mahara might be seen as an educational application rather than an independent ePortfolio application. I may be overstating things here because there are some examples of professions making use of Mahara outside of any learning management system context, such as the Aotearoa New Zealand Association of Social Workers and also the Nā Manukura o Apopo, the New Zealand Association for Māori Nursing and Midwifery. It's encouraging, and I think this is actually where Mahara needs to go, uh, to, where it needs to further develop. This goes well beyond what we'd originally anticipated for Mahara in the initial ECDF steering group, but it's a logical extension of what we had in mind back in those days. Recall that we saw Mahara as being for tertiary institutions. In the intervening years, this is extended to include everyone in this room, including those commercially oriented. That this has happened, I think, is evidence that Mahara has secured itself as an ePortfolio platform. It's not just a tool for tertiary students. It's a tool for right across the education sector and for registered professionals. So I think it's safe to conclude that Mahara has a clear identity. While it's well integrated with the likes of Moodle, it's still considered independently alongside the likes of ELG, PebblePad, and iWebfolio as a separate system. Before moving on to the young adulthood years, which is where Mahara now finds itself, I'd just like to encourage a bit of conversation among you. Please talk to the person next to you and ask them the question on this slide. Where would I go online to get the most up-to-date information about you professionally. Please, just uh, do that now if you wouldn't mind. Because um, I think the answer to this question, I think the answer to this question actually indicate where Mahara's midlife crisis might come from. So, please, any of you, where would I go to find the most up-to-date information about you online? Anyone? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Company website. My page on Mahara.org. My page on Mahara.org. Please, Aaron, stand up. <laughs> Please give us maximum applause. Wonderful. Okay. LinkedIn. Hmm. Let's come back to that. You see, my reason for exploring that question with you all is to make actually quite a very important point. Mahara has established itself as an ePortfolio application. The point is, though, that what constitutes an application has changed significantly over the last few years. So is an individual's need for an ePortfolio. 
An application used to be something that we installed in our desktop computers. It used to come on floppy disks. Anyone remember those? No, no poll there. No. Then CD-ROMs, then DVDs. Now it's an online service that we might subscribe to. More recently, though, the term app is associated with mobile, user-friendly, and highly accessible tablet-based technologies. We're used to applications working intuitively, giving us the ability to achieve what we want really quickly and with as little fuss as possible. I think Mahara is actually at a very, very critical stage. It either becomes intimate with the shift in technology or it risks isolation as other applications and services come along to steal its success. But the concept of an e-portfolio for, for professionals is also changing. How many of you have active LinkedIn accounts? Active LinkedIn accounts. Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you have Mahara internet portfolios? Okay, a considerable number. Fairly equi equitable. Which, though, is the more up-to-date? Mahara. Yeah. Mahara. Oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Which, though, do you most rely on for your web presence? No, it's too late. You, you told me before it was LinkedIn. <laughs> you, you can't cheat now. <laughs> I've got to admit, I'm actually a bit torn here. You see, on the one hand, I have a Mahara portfolio page which I continuously update and use as my major web presence. So when I'm speaking at events, so when I'm asked for a profile, I'll typically provide a really quick profile or quick overview and then link to this page. So I've been developed, uh, I've even developed a tiny URL to make uh, accessing this particular page a bit easier. On the other hand, I have this LinkedIn account with a slightly more selfie image. Apologies for that. I didn't realize my nose was so big. But that's, <laughs> that's my wife with me and she'd be absolutely horrified if she realized I was using this photo for my LinkedIn account, so please don't tell her, anyone. <laughs> Now, of course, I only have a free account here because the thought of paying 60 US dollars a month for a little bit of added vanity uh, really doesn't make sense to me. But it's the LinkedIn account that best meets my professional needs because it's here where I make connections. It's here where I get endorsed. It's also here where I'm continually reminded of who's up to what. I know that any update to my LinkedIn account is shared across my network. LinkedIn also has a powerful mobile phone app even available for my humble Windows 8 mobile phone, which I can use to easily update my profile and also link to others. As I suggested at the start of this presentation, Mahara is roughly 33 years old. It's in the middle of this young adulthood stage, and I think it's got some fundamental thinking to do before it reaches my tender years. And reinvention, though, is a common theme for people in this age group. Open Polytechnic, who I work for now, serves some 35,000 New Zealand adults, mostly over the age of 30, each year, many of whom are seeking to stretch their prospects further. In the terms of love that Ericsson suggests here, I think we need to consider some very, very important themes. Firstly, can Mahara learn to love the mobile world? Secondly, can Mahara help users to establish relationships with one another in the professional environment. And third, can Mahara learn to love other web presence options? I think it's quite insightful that friends and partners are the key relationship at the stage of adolescence because it's in these areas that Mahara needs to develop further. Romantic relationships in the application sense now rely on a convenient touchscreen user experience where the intervention is actually seamless. The interface just doesn't exist. It's so easy to use. Can Mahara keep up? I note now that there is a mobile browsing tool available for Mahara. I'd like to argue for continuing development here because this is crucial. A mobile application should be able to facilitate the sort of engagement with your account that you'd expect to on the go. Intimacy with the user is now more important than ever. Can Mahara become more intimate? Can it love? Can it let itself be loved in an increasingly mobile and cloud-focused user experience? Think also of the professionals now beginning to use Mahara, the social workers and nurses aligned with the two professional organizations mentioned earlier. Is their Mahara portfolio limited to the purposes of those organizations? Or do they also make additional tools such as LinkedIn? Do they also have to use accounts there too? You see, this becomes the overarching question. Can Mahara facilitate a user-centered, lifelong and mobile editable web presence from formal education right through to professional networking. 
Can Mahara become a more intimate online presence application? I hope to have my PhD conferred in the next few weeks. Could I update my Mahara resume and see it replicated in LinkedIn? Here's what I'd like to see developed. Firstly, a powerful mobile app. So this is probably my answer to the five, um, five things, Don. I know that there's one already available, but it's us poor Windows users do feel sorry for us. We can't access it. At first glance, the features look really promising. I'd like to see the app get a great deal of, atten of attention in terms of its usability, in particular, the extent to which it exploits the opportunities of each type of mobile device. Second, the ability to associate a page with a fixed URL, perhaps through domain options available to the Mahara application itself. For example, my current public page is found at tinyurl.com slash mnichols, which points to page ID number 168 on the myportfolio.ac.nz instance of Mahara. So if I move my Mahara account to a different provider, I lose access to that URL. Now for me, that's a real problem. My web presence is therefore fixed in a way that's dependent on my Mahara account provider. Could it be possible for me to nominate my own URL for my public portfolio from within the Mahara system? I mean, I'd pay for that sort of service. Third, I'd like full integration with my LinkedIn account. Ideally, a change to my Mahara account will also update my LinkedIn account. Also, my LinkedIn endorsements should be associated with my public page in Mahara. I note that Mahara is looking at badging quite seriously for its next release. I'd argue for something like this as well. This leads nicely onto the next function. Would it be possible to author, say, a WordPress blog from directly within Mahara, or access your LinkedIn account directly from the Mahara interface? Could Mahara become a portal for a user's online experience? Could such a portal include access to cloud storage and even file synchronization? <coughs> I guess where I'm coming from is that I'd like a monogamous online experience for my web presence. Mahara need not seek to replace these applications that have become established, but at the very least it can't afford to isolate itself from them. Perhaps I'm trying to think more broadly, I mean, or too broadly, because Mahara is, after all, an established ePortfolio application. My concern is that even as an ePortfolio system, Mahara may be missing out on further development, even for its educational role. Recently, um, in an international online learning discussion forum group I belong to, someone asked the question about whether Mahara would make a good e-portfolio system for their tertiary institution. The conversation went on for a few days with various perspectives offered. What was really interesting to me was the alternatives that folk were suggesting. Here's some examples of how Mahara was perceived. If all you're doing is blogging, then Mahara may be overkill, in which case WordPress is an excellent choice. Whether you host this internally or on WordPress.com, students can also easily export all of their content elsewhere. The WordPress app works very well on phones as well. Note the reference here to the phone app accessibility. Mahara is also criticized in that students can't email to blog. We're getting used to more flexibility in our use of online systems. And it's really important that Mahara steps up to these expectations. So are we developing the right features? What surprised me, though, was another response suggesting the use of Evernote. Evernote is an e-portfolio. We carried out a trial on using Mahara, right, so one listed user. One of the issues which arose was the inability to continue using Mahara once students graduated and where they could then export the portfolio. So they started on a case study from an Evernote trial. Evernote is actually a viable alternative in our mobile-oriented world. One discussant went on to explain that Evernote gives you offline access to your files, so it's more of a live file storage area. So is Mahara best situated as the basis for someone's lifelong professional profile? Coming back to Ericsson's framework, it seems Mahara has some time to work through these issues because, well, it's only about 33. In internet years, it's really until about mid-2015 to work through these challenges. I wonder, though, whether it's time for Mahara to completely re-envision itself. What I mean is this. At the moment, Mahara describes itself as, as being one of or both of these two things, an e-portfolio and a social networking system combined. 
There certainly is these things, but the, the social networking is to a large extent closed. I think Mahara needs to see itself a bit more broadly in response to how its context has moved on. I think Mahara needs to be three things. Firstly, it needs to be a professional e-portfolio platform, which it is now. It needs to be a mobile enhanced web presence, and it also needs to be a cloud-based synchronized file service. Even here, though, I don't think the, the vision is sufficient to give Mahara a really long-term extended future. More on this just a wee bit later. For now, each of these functions actually strengthens Mahara's capabilities in the portfolio platform and should see it renew its youth, at least to some extent. This, ultimately, is the challenge facing Mahara at the moment. Intimacy versus isolation. If it isolates itself, it will reveal that it's not capable of expressing digital love. If this is the case, its future as an independent application is, I think, really limited. It will move on to the next stage, that of middle adulthood, without having met the prerequisites for a healthy transition. As I indicated, though, there are developments taking place that will give Mahara a reasonably good life through its 30s. It's what comes next that's really key. Because in middle adulthood, generativity counts. I'm at this stage now, but I'm only just. The challenge of my life at the moment is to make sure I've made my life count. And showing care is my best way in which to achieve that. So my crisis is whether to stagnate as a person or to generate new ways of creating things that will outlast me for the benefit of others. The key to middle adulthood is trying to make the world a better place. Key for Mahara in this part of its future is really its ability to connect with household and workmates. In Mahara's case, I suggest this refers to other applications and services that contributes to the user's experience. I've already talked a bit about this in terms of where Mahara ought to go in its current young adulthood stage, but I'd like to go just a little bit further. I made casual mention before of Mahara needing to renew its youth, and this is actually quite an important theme, as anyone who's 40 plus can testify to. Youth, am I right on that? Yeah, yeah okay, good. Great. Youth renewal is a vital part of an application's longevity. You see, it's all too easy to become outdated in the internet world, especially when you're aging at 4.7 years per human year. Now, for the record, I'm not suggesting that everyone here over 40 is anything to worry about, because I'm in that category myself, and I still feel relevant and generative. Yeah, okay. <coughs> It's really that generative sense that Mahara needs to capture. If it does, it'll actually cease to age in internet years. You see, Google has achieved this. Google is now in its mid-70s in internet years, but it's rejuvenated itself by extending its core business. To explain this fully, I'll move on to the last of Ericsson's stages. Google is now in its mid-70s in internet years, yet it's still strong and it's still very, very vigorous. Key to its longevity is its extension of services beyond just being a search engine and more into becoming a user's online experience. And just, just consider this story. This is Google's history since 1998. And rather than go through this blow by blow, just take a look at what they've done over the years. What I want you to appreciate from this slide is that in 1998, Google was just a search engine, imagined alongside the likes of AltaVista, Magellan, Excite, InfoSeq, and Yahoo. Do those names ring any bells? Great, okay, only for those of us over 40. <laughs> These days, though, it's impossible to adequately define Google as anything but a company that builds products they hope will make the web better. It has continuously reinvented itself. It's extended its contribution to the user experience. Ultimately, I think Mahara has to do exactly the same thing. If Mahara continues to see itself as an e-portfolio platform, well, I think it'll serve its users well enough, but it will eventually be overtaken. Like Google, Mahara needs to see itself beyond being just a single application. 
At the moment, Mahara defines itself as an e-portfolio and social networking tool, and I've suggested it should arguably see itself now more as a professional e-portfolio platform, a mobile enhanced experience, and also a cloud-based synchronized file service. But I honestly don't think even this vision actually goes far enough to give Mahara more than a few years of reclaimed youth. I think I have the vision for Mahara's future, a vision that will help it last well into its hundreds. Mahara could be poised to become the Methuselah of online web applications. And I'm going to show you what that vision is on the next slide. Very shortly. <laughs> so without any further ado, if Mahara sees itself as enabling a user's web presence, I believe it will be able to keep itself away from the need to confront the existential question that indicates an upcoming demise. You see, if Mahara ever reaches maturity, it essentially signals its own impending death. E-portfolios are likely to be superseded in their usefulness. A web presence, though, is something that each user of the internet actually has. By basing Mahara around that concept, it will continually have the opportunity to a long and prosperous life. Of course, I'm no longer directly involved with Mahara, which gives me a fair amount of freedom to actually say these sorts of things. My infant left home a long time ago. The future of Mahara really rests with all of you, and also those around the world like you. So on behalf of Mahara's founders, and all who work so hard in its first year of life, I'd just like to express how proud we are that our little application has grown up so well. I can't speak highly enough of the original steering committee, of Meredith Henson's project work, of Richard Wiles' initiative in taking Mahara further, of Catalyst's leadership. And nor can I speak highly enough of what a fanatical group of people worldwide have done and taking Mahara through to its young adult years. So to people like each of you, thank you and well done. I see there's going to be some very interesting and significant conversations over the next two days. and I can't be here for them, unfortunately. But I hope this opening keynote has helped you to understand more of the heart that we gave Mahara, uh, more about the beat that started its life, and also see some of the potential that it has to continue into a long and prosperous life. If Mahara can find itself as the key to an individual's web presence, I think we'll be having Mahara events like this well, well into the future. Thank you. I think I've got some time. Yeah, I was just going to say we've got some time, so um, if anyone's got any questions for Mark, please ask away. <laughs> No, what, sorry, that search is what it does. Yes. Yep. Everything that Google does is still the search. I think it would be tragic if Mahara lost sight of the fact that however you chose to rename it, the portfolio thing was mm -hmm. what Mahara did. Yeah. Yeah, I, I fairly agree. I think, though, that over the last few years, what constitutes an e portfolio has changed significantly. Sure. I mean, the question about LinkedIn versus my portfolio was quite telling. Uh, I think unless Mahara can do something like LinkedIn, possibly further added value services, it'll find itself more marginalized as an option. I, I buy that a nice marriage with a service like LinkedIn. It seems to me would be better than Mahara trying to, uh, what your term, um, you know, steal what LinkedIn does. It's, mm. it's too late yeah. to steal what LinkedIn does, but you could have a very nice relationship. And uh, as regards the portfolio thing, it would be great if app developers, for example, could put their stuff in. Uh, if they could be handled by Mahara, I just don't know how it would be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is it interchangeable to think of Mahara it's not as researchable, but it's actually a fine making person findable? That is from the users that are generating this content rather than me being showcasing 
myself as a profession, I can actually fund from what I can do. And therefore, I think that is something that could potentially combine with more mobility and with the content creating and so on, decide of being more findable is mm. a step to more potential future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think um, these days, though, rather than search for people through a search engine, quite often people do use LinkedIn to actually find yeah. connections as well. So again, if we can get that integration in place, that would be great. But even for skills or competencies to meet the criteria, some advantages of how much we can think about myself and our eyes, but, and now we can log it in. Mm. Yeah, that, that sounds, sounds like the way we should be going. I think portfolios and Mahara and Mahara and portfolios in general as an aggregator, as an aggregator of an individual that's across the web and in different kinds of places. So potentially if you had something that you're in a web browser or you're in a file, that you've got some sort of functionality that you can push it into your Mahara without having to open up Mahara, upload it, mm. and all of that yeah. sort of stuff which drives people crazy. Yeah. Where it might have, you know, that you just quickly like something and it goes off to your Facebook. Yep. If you do something similar, then that would help people have that private space that they can control. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. We should get Mahara to the stage where you don't even think you're using Mahara. You're just doing things. Yeah, I think that that's really where the holy grail is for this, this next stage of uh, Mahara's life. Are you going to start? Yeah, I'm going to start. I'm going you want to know what I create and what I do, then you have to hire them with that and where you do those things. Yep. So they are in different spaces. They are, but I think LinkedIn will continue to develop. Um, I don't think LinkedIn will stay where it is. It may well get to the stage where you can actually put samples of your work up there, and it could actually encompass everything that Mahara does. Um, these applications don't remain static. I think, though, that Mahara does have a really good opportunity to draw in your, your LinkedIn data and, and possibly even have you linked or forward everything from your LinkedIn profile to your Mahara profile. It's that sort of future I think we should be considering. What, what was the, uh, I think I know the answer, but what's the reasoning of Kevin 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 so sorry, you, the question is why, why is my, my portfolio was separate from Mahara in terms of rather than you know you're existing on a slightly protected closed yeah. version of yeah. Mahara so, and my portfolio yeah, rather than the, the, the my portfolio service was originally set up to make it easily accessible for anyone in the tertiary sector. Um, so remember, Mahara was originally designed to as a social networking service. Yeah. So we saw the my portfolio .ac um, single area. It's the opportunity for anyone to connect uh, through that one instance. As people move on, though, um, it's quite difficult to take that same profile, yeah. that same page. It, it, it really yeah. seems a shame that it exists as a separate yeah. entity rather than, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd rather my students were existing. Yeah, I mean, the, so, I mean, the dream of Mahara is that there's one Mahara per country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, yeah. what we have, done a, what we have done a lot of work on is ensuring that we can export portfolios in open format that can be imported into other Maharas or other systems. But but yeah, ideally, you know, every country has its or has one for the world. Yeah, yeah but so I mean, yeah. what would put you behind geographically isolating the system? Yeah, I it's one thing trust. There's an issue of trust for educators and, and, and so the, the mic, there's yeah. two mic portfolios in schools, it's dot AC and dot school. Yeah. And um, there was a certainly a fear that School students in the compulsory sector, particularly younger students, shouldn't be exposed to the big bad world, and in particular students in the tertiary sector, that that might be inappropriate. Um, but we've always tried hard to avoid uh, warp gardens within those multi-tenant sites. And again, there's been a lot of demand from schools saying, "No, no, we want the warp of gardens. We don't want, uh, you know, wanting." College boys talking to Wangtanese girls via, you know, my portfolio that that could lead to evil things happening. But so there is this constant tension about, you know, uh, inclusiveness, bigger community, lifelong learning, and the 
desire to protect our lives. I made, yeah. Yeah. I made mention in, in my address about um, the possibility of exporting to your own domain name, uh, possibly from within the My Portfolio Service or the Mahara Service. I think if we had that, then you actually do get a true independence of yeah. portfolio hosting. So I think that's really another feature we should yeah. be, should be considering. Because yeah. um, I'm coming from um, further education in England, where I used to teach in 1990 uh, in, a, in a further education college, and we used Moodle. And then looking at Mahara now, I think that it, you've done an amazing job in terms of what your abilities are to be able to administer and, and use Mahara as an educational tool. And my question really is, um, and I might say something, but um, you know, how far is it actually used inside tertiary education? Because you see, it is transferable, because I've just transferred from one college to another, um, and all my work and everything that I did for my students in the previous college, I've still got access to, and I can still work with it, I can still use it, and I can still assign my new students in my new college <coughs> to have a look at these pages. You know, the potential there for education, because taking it from tertiary to secondary is a really good good avenue, and I think the Ministry of Education has done a really good job in, in doing that, because, again, I heard someone talk about uh, moderation. You know. I have, last year, a lot of work that I did in digital technology with my students to be able to send it for moderation, but the problem is, I'm on my own, you know, like nobody else has accepted it yet, um, but I think that's something of the future, because Google Docs is all embraced throughout the schools and secondary schools, but I think it's limited in its abilities, and one day soon, people are going to go, well, okay, I've learned Google Docs, what, what else can I do? You're going to be what is next is what you can offer. I think that's what needs to be put. And anyway, question how much <laughs> is it is it used in tertiary education? I don't know. How many tertiary <laughs> educators here? Okay, institutions, anyone just yell them out? Canterbury, Canterbury. Massey, Waikato, Wintech, sorry, Takari, Titani Puri Order. In order, yeah. Open Polytechnic. MIT AUT. Okay, so really broad adoption right across New Zealand's tertiary sector anyway. And if we had it in the secondary schools already there and done and dusted, you'd have a lot easier job yeah. and implementing it in, in tertiary. Yeah. And speaking internationally, we also have um, a lot of kids from uh, Australia, so the University of Holloway is using it, um, and a lot of other Australian universities and a lot of universities in the States. And in Europe, it's coming more so. There's a big presence of tertiary institutions and the German school of Yes, and, and UK as well, as you mentioned earlier. UK as well. I mean, it is, yeah, um, we can talk about this for a long time, so I won't ask you. Um, if there's, we're sort of getting towards the end of time now, but um, thank you, Mark. Um, that was actually probably one of the best keynotes I've heard in many, many years. It was uh, extremely thoughtful, informative and very challenging. Um, Aaron and I were busy writing lots of notes. I started writing <laughs> down what I was doing at the age of 33, which um, you won't believe how long ago that was, looking at me. Um, <laughs> so I started a company. I had a child and I bought a house. That's quite life, uh, life-changing year for me, that one. And, um, and I think Mahara should buy a fast car. <laughs> but that's really, Mark's really set the tone for this, this conference. These are exactly the sort of issues that, that we've been discussing internally, that are discussed in the Mahara Forum, but really distilled down to some core and important uh, things that we should be addressing. So um, I think you've done a magic job in setting the tone. Thank you, Mark.